Yes. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome. I'm uh, Mihaela Campion, and again, I would like to welcome you all uh, to our event today, Human Rights Class Race on Digital Stages, an event organized by Archer, American Romanian Coalition for Human and Equal Rights, with our very, very special guest speakers today, Saviana Stănescu and Vernice Miller. Um, welcome, thank you for being here and accepting our invitation to have an animated, hopefully, conversation today. Thank you for inviting us, Mihaela. Thank you, Mihaela. Uh, very excited. I'm, uh, I'm very excited to be in conversation with you, being a great admirer, and also um, discussing about this new play uh, be trapped inside the window, which addresses a lot of important issues in contemporary life that Archer is supporting and promoting, and um, we'll, get, we'll get into this uh, very soon. Um, a few things about housekeeping. We would like everyone who is listening to us today um, to make comments, to ask questions. We hope this to be an interactive conversation. So feel free to make comments in the, um, in the comment section of this uh, presentation. Uh, we also have here today um, Krina uh, Tarasi from uh, Archer, who is going to monitor the questions and comments. So at the end, we are going to leave about 10, 15 minutes, depending how many we have um, for this um, interacting conversation with the audience. And Krina will present um, our guest speakers the questions and the comments in, um, in the video uh, presentation. Uh, a few words about our guest speakers today. Saviana Stănescu is a cutting edge Romanian playwright, poet, and artivist based in New York. Uh, she is one of uh, Archer's ambassadors. It's the second time when she's uh, honoring us with her incredible presence. Um, lots of achievements. If I go through the list, we'll probably spend another hour here, <laughs> but I highly recommend everyone to check her website at saviana.com. Um, few of her plays in the United States, just to mention just a few of them, uh, include aliens with extra, uh, extraordinary skills, and white embers, um, useless, Lenin's shoe, uh, for a barbarian woman, uh, and the last one, be trapped inside the window. Uh, welcome, Saviana, again, and thank you for uh, joining us today. And congratulations for everything you do to make the world a better place for all of us. Oh, thank you so much for this introduction, Mihail. Um, Vernice Miller um, is um, what an accomplished woman, I would say, you know, director, performer, producer, and artivist. Um, and I was impressed when reading your, um, your achievements. I was impressed by your uh, overseas experience, you know, working in so many places like South Africa and Poland and Slovenia also a contributor to HBO and CBS. Absolutely incredible. So um, welcome. You are here today as the director of the new play of Saviana's play, um, Be Trapped Inside the Window. 
and uh, thank you again for accepting our invitation. It is it is absolutely my pleasure to be here and to participate in this Archer discussion. Thank you. Uh, I would recommend everyone who is watching today or later uh, to check the um, bios, the complete bios of Saviana and Vernice in the event description. So you can find out more there, also check their websites and um, uh, feel free to ask questions if you are curious about their um, activities and careers. Uh, so we are here today to discuss about issues that this new play, actually the play is considered to be a new provocative drama, <laughs> right? Um, to discuss issues like you know, around human rights and race and ethnicities and um, freedom also. So I would like to start by asking you, Saviana, what was the inspiration for the play and why a new provocative drama? <laughs> Thank you, Mihaela. Well, it's a long story. I'm going to try to make it uh, really short. Uh, generally my work, um, my plays, um, um, try to spotlight um, outsiders, outcasts, people who have been marginalized, uh, oppressed or othered in a way or another. So this has been my self-proclaimed mission um, ever since my first um, dramatic poem in Romanian, uh, Proscrisa, the outcast. So this has been uh, my lifelong uh, uh, work. And usually I spotlight women, women uh, that um, need to be in the spotlight and um, need to have their voices heard, at least through making them a character. So in this particular play, um, I was focusing on human rights, domestic slavery, um, and other issues uh, surrounding uh, uh, biracial families and uh, biracial uh, people, uh, but also particularly in trying to spotlight these three women with their inner struggles, frustrations, um, their dramatic journeys, um, and especially in this case, because it's so much about monologues and uh, these women observing each other, it's also about um, uh, somehow bringing this message that we need to, to communicate with each other, to be in solidarity with each other in order to support each other, help each other and bring issues like domestic slavery uh, to light. So that is briefly the story. I was inspired by an article in the Atlantic. I was inspired by many immigrant stories. I was inspired by the book, uh, uh, Hidden Girl, uh, the true story of a, a slave girl uh, by Shima Hall. Uh, I was inspired by many, many um, stories. Uh, the NPR segment in the uh, Brian Lehrer show, uh, which were sort of responses to the Atlantic article. As a former journalist, um, I do take inspiration from uh, real life stories that I can find in uh, the media, but also, of course, from many stories that I personally know, and I'm trying to put them together in creating these fictional, fictional characters that are in the play. Yeah, and you are, you know, mastering all of this, putting them together, all these stories and making these characters so alive and um, inspiring. Um, Vernice, I'd like to ask you, how, how was it for you to bring in these three women um, with different backgrounds and uh, ages and social status. How, how was your experience of um, bringing them alive, you know, in the, in the play? Well, um, it, getting the women to uh, re reveal themselves, uh, um, that in itself is um, not the difficulty, the difficult part of the journey, because there's the, the, the commonality of humanity, right? And so these three women, even though they're from different socioeconomic classes and they're from uh, a, a different cultural backgrounds, and in, in, um, for one of the women, she's just now uncovering her, her identity and it's her journey 
of identity and who she is and her questions that reveals the others. Um, uh, I think more importantly, at the heart of what Saviana has offered us is this question of visibility and whether or not these women actually see each other. Um, uh, I, I'm uh, an adjunct professor at John Jay College and one of the things that, one of the themes we constantly explore is this idea of listening. And in particular, listening, not just with the ears, but also with the eyes. And how do we listen to what's happening around us? And this play, um, to me, is, is a huge uh, exploration. Are we listening? Are we listening to uh, what's happening uh, right next to us? Are we listening to what's happening inside our own homes? And so uh, the central character, her journey towards um, on her understanding of her, her birth story and her understanding of who she can become is what sends all uh, sends us takes us all on this journey of understanding these three women and what connects them is um, bigger than what divides them. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. I think pointing to the aspect of visibility, observing and listening, you know, mm -hmm. these are key elements in the play. And I think they are key elements in, in our daily lives. I Absolutely. think we tend to observe um, probably what we choose to observe, but not everything that is observable, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I heard you, Saviana, saying somewhere, I, I, don't, I don't think I heard, I probably read somewhere, that you tried to open a window. Um, and I, I really like that. Can you say more about it? Yes, um, especially in this play, uh, all these women are uh, sort of stuck in their own bubble. And um, the idea is that this isolation that maybe now we can all relate to a certain extent to uh, this isolation, these, these bubbles that so many people have, um, it's just a sort of enclosed space uh, uh, that we do need to open a metaphorical window and uh, real windows to really see uh, what happens um, outside our real and imagined walls. People build so many walls, real and imagined, walls to keep immigrants outside, walls to keep other people outside. It's so much about walls uh, that we forget to open windows and create the windows and doors and opportunities for people to, to truly connect. And I loved what Vernice said, that we need not only to listen, but also listen with our eyes, see. And I would add, we also need to listen with our souls. We need a, a deeper connection with, with other people and um, trying to really uh, connect beyond the real and imagined walls and real and imagined borders. Yeah, I completely agree uh, and would even elaborate on, on what Saviana just said in that the one of the, the journeys we take in the play is that the daughter is able to help her mother to open up that window in her heart and uh, to go deeper to not just uh, attack the surface uh, generosity that she's capable of, but what else? What else is there? And how much deeper can we go? So yes, this metaphor of opening the window, I think is uh, um, even more personal than, the, uh, than climbing the walls because it, um, it points the finger to the fact that it does indeed begin at home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very powerful message, you know, I, it really caught my eye when I read it. Mm. And then I use it as a metaphor as well, you know, because <laughs> it's, uh, it's not only um, for the outside, but for the inside as well. Um, one of the things that um, caught my attention watching the play was also the idea of secrets. Um, which is a common theme for immigrants. Um, and I can extend that from my personal experience, uh, professional experience. It's also a common theme for minorities. What do you make out of that? How do you um, 
relate to that because it's mentioned in the play a few times, you know, like when the daughter really wants to uh, find out, you know, and that was a secret. She doesn't know anything about her father. She doesn't know uh, many things about her mother's past, right? Her grandfather or uh, family members and the mother is trying to shift the conversation all the time into the here and now, which is not a bad technique, right? She wants to, you know, have dinner and uh, talk about other things, but the daughter seems to be so hungry to know more about her past and um, to define her identity, as you, Bernice, said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you want to start, Saviana? I say you start this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, this this idea of um, secrecy, I think, is so pervasive in many cultures and for different reasons, especially um, uh, for those of us who come from small town experiences. Uh, you know, the, the, one of the characters talks about the fact that um, everybody knew everything about her life in her town. And I, too, come from a small town in Jamaica, and I know what that's like that, you know, when I was in school and, uh, it, and there were uh, no telephones, but somehow my mother knew by the time I got home, things that I'd done, infractions that I'd done in school, and I had to account for that. How did that grapevine work that before I could get home? You know, and, and so the idea of secrecy then, especially in those kinds of cultures, becomes really important to preserving any, any sort of autonomy that the, you know, the families then, you know, uh, tell the children what not to say. There's always like the uh, perennial joke of the child who answers the door, answers the phone. You know, my mother said she's not home. <laughs> and so, you know, the, I, I don't think it's just endemic to like um, necessarily to, to immigrant communities. I think it's any small town life anywhere that this is one of the byproducts of secrecy. And um, and then for this young woman who's biracial, um, there is of course the, the the aspect of how do you, as a person of color, uh, as a black person, a black descendant, find out your story when our stories were taken away from us? And so the journey that this um, woman now has to take to find out even her ancestral lineage becomes something even more uh, magnified and more, and more significant. Um, and, and, and so yes, a secrecy, uh, it, it can be um, devastating uh, if we don't know who we are and how to find our stories. Um, and uh, luckily um, we're, we're developing more and more tools that can help us to tell our stories and to find out who we are and sort of uh, set our feet more firmly on the on the earth, right, yeah, Saviana? Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. Uh, yeah, I, Bernice actually explained <laughs> it beautifully. So I would say that indeed, we are defined by the stories we are told and the stories we tell, right? So the first stories that we are told are in the family and then the other stories that are told are in school and by the society generally. And especially at this time, I feel that uh, so many young people and generally so many people are trying to um, grapple with their identity. Who are we? Uh, who, we who are we really? <laughs> and um, uh, are we represented on stage, for instance? Who is represented on stage? Who's telling the story? Whose story we are telling? So I feel that there is such an important moment right now uh, in terms of stories and identity Entities and people trying to explore and um, unravel these different layers of someone's identity. So I definitely, I felt compelled to, to, to explore that as a playwright. And on the other hand, to be honest, on a aesthetic uh, <laughs> level, uh, you know, so many mainstream dramas are about family secrets. But in this particular play, I try to challenge also the mainstream uh, aesthetics of a 
well-made play, right? It's, this play is uh, interwoven monologues that build towards sliding into dialogue. So this play challenges traditional aesthetics. It combines monologues and narration with some dialogue. So I did want to take that um, almost old fashioned device of family secrets and turn it into something new that is more real actually, more um, representative and more, I don't know, I feel it's even deeper because it, uh, it explores these kind of stories be beyond the surface of uh, mainstream uh, dramatic structures. And as a playwright, I always like to push the limits, push the borders of, uh, dramatic structure and mainstream aesthetics um, as well. Ever since I've, I've written my first um, wild dramatic poems and uh, plays. So this is part of um, that kind of um, uh, self-imposed mission that I have. I even wrote recently an article in Romanian for Scena. Uh, RO, our one of the main theater journals in Romania, and I called it uh, the narraturgy of uh, <laughs> barbarian bees because I combined this, you know, the story about um, the bee with narraturgy, which is uh, a form that combines narration and dramaturgy. Mexican playwrights coined the term narraturgia, and they uh, work a lot in this kind of intersection of monologues and dialogues. But I don't think that in the mainstream drama here in the US, this has really taken flight. And uh, also, of course, my new book of plays uh, for a barbarian woman, uh, which actually, you know, has uh, the original monologue that um, inspired uh, Be Trapped um, Inside the Window. Uh, Godfrey Simmons, the, the producer who used to work for the Civic Ensemble, he was the co-artistic director of the Civic Ensemble, and now he's the artistic director of the Heartbeat Ensemble. So that monologue, which was a short uh, May monologue, and uh, he uh, commissioned me to expand uh, the main monologue into a full length play. This is how Be Trapped Inside the Window actually got born. And um, I, I was so lucky to work with the Vernis from the very beginning uh, to workshop the play uh, in Ithaca to have uh, a little production there. So I like to, to uh, talk a little more about that. And if Bernice wants to uh, say more, because Bernice actually uh, is one of the very few uh, American directors who is able to go beyond this kind of mainstream drama and the kind of psychological realistic aesthetics that is pre still prevalent on Broadway. There are some exceptions, obviously, but it's still prevalent. And Vernice is one of the very few directors who knows to work beyond that uh, traditional language into a physical voc vocabulary and poetic movement vocabulary. So I like to uh, to let her talk more about that. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. Go, ahead, go ahead, Michaela. No, no, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear that. <laughs> well, because I'm very grateful for the experiences that I've had and um, the, the various countries that I've had the opportunity to work in and the people I've been able to work with, um, starting with my work at Odin Teatret and, um, and, uh, and work with um, Grotowski and Richard Cheslak. And, uh, and um, one of the things about this play that was revealed during this Zoom uh, experience that we're having was just this idea of the stylistic approach of the, 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 the narratives, the dialogues, uh, the narrative sliding, the monologue sliding into dialogue and how this idea of us being in these little boxes was actually the, the Zoom format actually heightened that for us. Uh, we had explored it when we were, um, uh, when we did the um, live uh, presentation of an Ithaca, but even more so here, uh, I, I think uh, Saviana will attest to the fact that just be, being in these boxes uh, became even more emblematic, embla emblematic of what it was that the play was saying about the division and possible unification of you know and and um, I am like so, so excited to come back to do this now uh, in live to see the what knowledge we're taking from the experience that we've had of having ourselves in these little windows 
Mm. And how, how do we now transfer the depth of information that we found in this reading and bring that to the live performance? I am, uh, I'm, I'm like, I, I can't wait for that opportunity. Wow. It sounds yeah. exciting and I can sense your excitement in exploring something new and different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that's why the play uh, was called provocative because actually, of course, uh, first is provocative in terms of the topics explored, but second is also provocative in terms of uh, uh, challenging traditional dramatic structures and uh, theatrical structures, both from the playwriting perspective and directing perspective, and probably from the actor's perspective as well. Um, just a few um, remarks here in case we have people who joined us later. Um, as a reminder, we are discussing today um, uh, with Saviana Stanescu, the playwright, and Bernice Miller, the director of Saviana's new play, Be Trapped Inside the Window. It's a conversation around issues like human rights, class, race, and freedom. And uh, for those who have not watched the play yet, these are some information that can be useful if you want to still catch it until March 21st, I believe, right? So it's a week. 26. Oh, 26. Um, so that's great. If you didn't have a chance to see the play you still have time and it's a free um performance that can be you, you just need to register for it do you want to say a little bit more about how people can see the play in case they just joined us yeah i think they can see it from either website either the heartbeat ensemble or the romanian cultural institute and uh what, what I, I said the 26th but it's actually the 21st it, it began on the 26th yeah. it was february 26th and it will run through uh march 21st yeah yes so we only have one more week of performances so if you want to see it um, uh, please rush to see it basically you sign up you register on uh, the heartbeat ensembles website where there is a link be trapped inside the window they just ask for your name and your email basically and you are being sent a, a, a link with the performance with a password that's all so you can watch the show at your own pace whenever you you are available so you don't need to watch it immediately because some friends of mine did tell me that they were reluctant to sign up because they thought they needed to see it at that point but no you just um, register you will be sent a link and a password and you can watch it at any time until march 21st basically next uh, saturday so so please do sign up and you can watch it you can stop it you can watch uh, 10 minutes and then 30 whenever you are free. So don't um, let that uh, stop you. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. Um, that's exactly what I've done, Saviana. <laughs> I watched it first <laughs> and then I went back and uh, watched again and then back to some segments of it that I kind of wanted to get a little bit deeper into. Um, definitely worth watching and not only this play, but this is the last one Saviana wrote, but any of her plays are uh, an inspiration and they are provocative. Um, and speaking of that, um, and in, you know, um, aligned with Archer's mission, um, you bring up in this play the, um, idea of modern day slavery. I think it's mentioned a few times uh, in the play. And, um, you know, I kind of felt the, hmm, you know, a, a little bit of a discomfort, a body response when I heard the term used in the play. And I think that's a good thing uh, for me. I like to be provoked and think deeper. Uh, mainly because this is a topic that we don't openly discuss. I, I don't usually have conversations with my friends around issues like modern life slavery. So 
what was the um, what's the message? What's the uh, intent of um, bringing this up? Modern day slavery. Alec, you start, Saviana, as a writer. Okay, uh, so yes, um, uh, as I said, modern day slavery has been a topic that um, I was exploring, actually, I've been exploring it for the last um, 10 years. I was working on it for another project with the director Tamila Udard as well. So uh, I, I did lots of um, research on this topic. And um, uh, I think it's an important topic precisely because people don't talk enough about it. And um, uh, this fact that this, uh, uh, there is modern day slavery in the sense that there are people working for no pay, for no wages, like um, those stories I mentioned. Um, uh, uh, I mentioned at the beginning of this discussion, the one that I read in the Atlantic or the Shima Hall story. But even uh, in other contexts, the term slaves, modern day slaves has been used, for instance, in uh, the discussions about the exchange program uh, for au pair foreign women who have been uh, you know invited to to uh, study and work in the US for uh, for a year and they basically uh, for for just for uh, housing and uh, food they had to work for upper class uh, uh, white families generally uh, and really work so hard that there is an article in the Politico called they treat us like slaves. So it has been on many levels, this kind of discussion. And I think it basically goes down to how could we ha still have people who work so hard for no wages are treated really poorly by their uh, bosses, they are treated literally like uh, like slaves many times they don't have any day off they they don't have any family or friends or uh, anything else to do outside the work for the family so no matter how we put it and the in the article in the atlantic actually uh, there were people saying oh but we treat um, lola like our family she's like a grandma for us well no it's not okay it's not okay to it you don't treat people like that and have them work so hard for you um, uh, for no money in this day and age. So uh, I think, and many other people think that this issue needs to be uh, explored, talked about more. And uh, as a playwright, that's the little thing I can do <laughs> to yeah. explore it in a play. And I think that many people, when they hear the term uh, slavery, they think in terms of historical context, they don't think um, of the circumstances today where people are being exploited. But it was the Reverend Barber of the Poor People's Campaign who recently talked about specifically um, uh, the economic uh, um, uh, uh, slavery of, of people of color and, and the fact that uh, in when 400 years ago, when uh, uh, people were uh, black people were brought here from Africa to build this country, that they were not paid a wage. And today, uh, 400 years later, the wage is 750 in an hour. Uh, and, and we just had this massive bill passed and uh, the, 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 our, our politicians, the people who sit on top of uh, our monies decided to keep things as they were. And the $15 an hour minimum wage was not passed. If we wanna talk about slave labor, let's look at what the people that we send to uh, govern and dispense our monies are doing with it. Um, you know, th th this question of uh, um, people's freedoms, um, uh, back to the question of invisibility. Um, it, it, it's it, within the, the play, the, uh, the story that um, Saviana was inspired by uh, um, talk, speaks uh, of a Filipino um, family. But I know from the Caribbean of, of these stories of families who cannot make ends meet and they will willingly um, send their children into situations that they think are better 
for them. But, uh, you know, without eyes on them, they don't know the circumstances that those children are um, growing up under. It happens in India. It happens in Africa with these little t young children who are um, the, the families give their children to the, the fishermen because they have these little hands that can go and get um, and, and work with the nets. So it's a global situation where we are still in a situation where the, 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 the powerful are taking advantage of those who are who don't have the power yet. Um, and uh, it, it, yes, as, as creators of the stories we tell, as playwrights, as directors, as producers, we have an obligation to shed the light on what is really happening on this planet. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's, our, it's our obligation, I think, to do so. It's not just an opportunity, but an obligation. And when we come across a playwright like Saviana, who has um, all these deep cultural roots in, in not just uh, Romania, but also in the United States and who can straddle these stories and, and bring these different women together and to tell this uh, very deeper story simply by, by the inspiration of that story. And you know, Saviana, I told you that when I came back to New York, I, uh, who have the habit of uh, taking up um, news articles and filing them away as things that I'd like to explore later on, found that I'd actually taken the same story and filed it away. And I completely forgot about it when we first um, worked on this. And so it was such a wonderful reminder to come back to my file and see, aha, yes, we're doing that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you, Bernice. And I need to add a layer here because, uh, yes, it's about modern day slavery, but uh, the issue of immigration and undocumented immigrants is really a huge issue here because when you have uh, no, no papers and you are in this kind of uh, uh, awful situation to work for, for, uh, for a family, they indeed can treat you the way they want because yeah. you, you have not, you, I mean, you think, so, or some people think that there's nothing they can do to get out of their situation because you don't have uh, uh, legal papers, you don't have uh, um, uh, a passport. Sometimes they just keep the passport, uh, the people who brought you in. So uh, it is a huge um, uh, problem, but I do want to tell people, and many other people said that already on, the, on NPR and many other venues, that there are uh, there are possibilities. So I don't know, I don't imagine anyone in this situation will listen to us now, but if it is, um, if someone is listening to us who knows somebody in this kind of situation, uh, please um, uh, support that person. Let them know that there are avenues available for them to speak up, to get, to get out of that situation. There are immigration lawyers and other organizations, uh, not-for-profit organizations that can help you and they can help those kind of people. So um, just uh, so much is about the fact that uh, many people in those kind of situations having not having papers, uh, meaning they are undocumented here in the US, uh, they uh, are in a way um, a victim of this kind of power dynamic. When you might think that there's nothing you can do, it's almost like a Stockholm syndrome uh, that you cannot get out of the situation. It happens also with victims of domestic violence uh, and victims of sex traffic. You just you get stuck. You are stuck in that situation and people, need, I think, most oftenly, this kind of hand support from outside a little bit, from a fellow human who might step in to help. Yeah, yeah without, without the larger community being aware and being able to be of assistance, these people who are so vulnerable are afraid to, to make, any, uh, make themselves visible. Uh, they think that their invisibility protects them. And, uh, and a lot of these people are not, um, much like the character in our play, are not aware of the fact that they're being taken advantage of. But those of us who are in better circumstances, who can look around and see and question, these are, we, are, we are the ones who are in that position of privilege to be able to look and see who is this person and how are they being compensated for what they are doing. Yes. Exactly. And one of our privileges as theater artists is that you, we can bring this kind of voices from invisibility to visibility. You know, this is the power of theater. 
this is the power of the art as uh, cheesy as it might sound uh, this is what we can do as yeah. artists to make uh, invisible uh, pain visible excellent points from both of you and um I think just to add to what you mentioned, both of you actually mentioned that some of the people who are um, watching this conversation or those who are watching your play may not be in a situation like this. There is a great possibility that we all to a certain extent are in a situation of not being aware of what modern day slavery is and the fact that domestic servitude, it's only one factor, it's only one possibility of modern day slavery. There are many others, as you said, sex trafficking. I mean, there are so many possibilities um, and we may not even know. We may see someone, right? I may see someone, um, you know, walking down the street in my neighborhood in Chicago, a babysitter with two kids, you know, um, and I don't know. I mean, I don't know if she has a legal status here. I don't know how much she's paid. I don't know if she's a live-in uh, or not, uh, or if she is officially hired. So even though we may not be in that particular situation, I think it's important for us to listen, to observe and to look around and question when we see um, cases like this, because we, we can make a difference. You through arts, Archer through our mission, uh, and in conjunction, we can, we can gather forces to bring awareness and to really um, help people to think in a different way, to question that, you know, is this person hired? How much is she paid for the job, you know? Um, yeah, any absolutely. We can even take the discussion further, and we are just talking about these basic levels of supporting someone to get out of of a, this kind of very difficult situation uh, on a, a basic physical, economical um, uh, level. But we haven't even brought up the issue of mental health <laughs> issues. Exactly. I mean, can you even imagine if we start talking about the uh, mental health in what kind of situation some uh, people are in this kind of domestic slavery situation, but but generally, I mean, even recently, Meghan Markle was talking about what was like for her, but she had to go out and put on a smile and uh, have the public persona, the work that she had to do, but she tried to reach out to the royal family and she didn't get help. So what are we talking about? You know, now we are talking about uh, people in this kind of uh, very uh, poor situations, poor from an economical level and um, underprivileged. And um, uh, things happen on all levels. We just need to raise awareness on mental health issues, domestic slavery issues, all kinds of issues that we could all do something to ameliorate by just paying attention and trying to, to communicate with each other and trying to, to make sure that we don't judge people, don't make assumptions based on appearances, but um, try as much as we can to uh, uh, pay real attention, to get to know people. Yeah, yeah it, it really starts with, one, with believing in the fact that people should live lives of dignity and equity. And if we really believe that, then we start looking outside of our uh, individual silos with those eyes to say, is, is this an equitable situation that this person next door to me is, is living in? Are, are these um, people who are working in the, um, in the kitchen at the restaurant that I frequent, are, are they being compensating ad adequately? Uh, there are all these circumstances, especially living in a society like we live in here in the United States where there's so many people within the service industry and are those people being adequately compensated? I think coming out of this, um, this period of this pandemic, we are about to really have to grapple with this issue of class and race and people uh, having access, having 
uh, to the, 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 the financial freedom that they need to make the next moves in their lives and for their families. And we could be on the brink of uh, many people going through generational poverty here if it's not handled correctly. And I, I do agree with you, Saviana, that the mental health of uh, um, all of us, because you know we, we are all connected. So if the people who are working with us or engaged with us or parts of the service um, community, if their mental health is a question, how our mental health is also a question. We, uh, we, we are not um, isolated. We are connected. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with this being my field of expertise. And there is a new, it's very interesting that you brought this up and I don't want to dive into too much because I'm too passionate about it and will take too much time. Uh, but there is a new, um, uh, more and more studies show now that it's a collective response. So if I'm around someone who suffers from depression and isolation, you know, the issue of isolation in the play, it's exactly, it's directly linked with anxiety and depression, right? Uh, but if I'm surrounded by someone who suffers from depression, from anxiety, from any, any form of trauma, then I am also affected because in that interaction, there is a collective response to the experience of another. And I think that's a very important point that needs to be addressed and uh, people to become more and more aware that even though someone suffers in isolation from depression or anxiety or trauma, we are still affected by it collectively. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, very heavy. We we all need to take a deep breath here because this is very, <laughs> very well, I think that uh, yeah, we need to say it and say it again that we are all interconnected in this global world. And actually people of color are a global majority. So we need to talk more about the global majority and this uh, also global world that has us interconnected. We are all affected. We are all affected affected by poverty that yeah. exists in, in uh, some countries or communities or homes. We are all affected by mental health issues and uh, other issues that people can have in their small bubble, might that be home, community, town, country. Um, all my work as a playwright is somehow about this kind of power dynamics between and among individuals and between and among countries. So I'm deeply invested in uh, exploring this kind of power dynamics and what can we do to create a more balanced life. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it, you know, so well. <laughs> You know, Saviana, it makes me think about the most, um, um, the, the largest space within the United States where this idea of um, modern day slavery exists, which is the prison industrial complex. And I begin to wonder um, about the, the, who's addressing the mental state of, of these people um, and, and while they're incarcerated and when they're released because the, 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 the trauma that is done to so many people and so many people of color who are unjustly incarcerated for other um, uh, uh, things that people get a slap on the wrist for and what that does to them and how they're able to then engage within the larger community. Um, it, it, it's something that has to be addressed. It needs to be addressed in, in, a, in a, with a sense of urgency. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, absolutely. I and think anti-blackness, uh, anti-blackness that is still prevalent, unfortunately, and it's related to the, the prison mm -hmm. complex and the pipeline. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I think we all agree here and we hope those who watch our conversation, they will find their own voice um, to be heard. Uh, we all agree that we need more treatment centers and not prisons. I think that's, you know, that's Absolutely. been known for a very long time and has uh, very little done for it, unfortunately. Um, but silence, which is a theme in the play actually, and now we are connecting the theme of the play with the silence uh, of 
our own. I mean, I think I feel like I'm complicit to that to a certain extent. I feel sometimes that my voice is not loud enough for the complexity of the issues that we are dealing with um, regularly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's this idea of breaking the silence, which I think you address it in the place, Aviana, you uh, crafted that so well, uh, Vernice, and we are talking about this now. Uh, how can we break the silence? How can we um, fight for equality? Equality is threatening for many people. I think many people are threatened by equality. Yeah, I mean, that's why the title of the play is Be Trapped Inside the Window. And only one aspect is uh, the domestic slavery, because all these three characters, they are trapped inside the window in a different way and on a different um, level. Mia, the, the biracial, the black uh, uh, journalist, uh, this is actually a play that's the coming of age story of Mia. Who, who learns to, to find herself and to uh, see who she really is and find her voice as a journalist, as a biracial woman, as a black woman. And uh, she's finally, she's the one who brings uh, uh, these stories uh, to life and to, to the larger uh, people. So um, yes, Be Trapped Inside the Window is the central metaphor of this play because to a certain extent, all these three women and many of us are trapped inside a window. We see the light outside, we see the sun, but we might not be able to get out for different reasons. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a metaphor to, uh, to come back to it and to explore on our own. Am I trapped inside the window and how? And how can I help myself not to? Um, and that's Erin Lockett, actually oh, an amazing actress, like all our actors, Lydia Gaston and uh, Jennifer Dore White. Erin um, Lockett uh, was my student at Ithaca College, brilliant, brilliant actor. And now she's, uh, uh, of course, a professional actress and we love to work with her. And Lydia Gaston and Jennifer Dore White uh, are New York based um, actors. Jennifer Dore White was in the first play I did uh, at the Lark, the Lark Play Development Center, my play Waxing West. So I'm really connected in many ways with Jennifer. She was also in my play Lenin Shoe at the Lark. I developed um, most of my plays in New York at the Lark play development center so see all these things are connected <laughs> wonderful you know in a wonderful way um yeah actually mia um for me she's uh, she brings that you know that um light the hope yes uh, she's so inquisitive and she uh she's open to learn and to connect with this woman and find out her story so i think I think she brings hope. <laughs> I don't know if it was your intention, uh, but definitely I had that reaction. Um, yeah, and I, I think the actress, Erin Lockett, um, she, uh, uh, she exemplifies the next generation, right? Because as uh, Saviana said, she was a student of hers. And, um, and there is something that's very hopeful from that generation in terms of um, how we are dealing with these ideas of inequity that these younger generation are standing up and they are calling it out and they want to change our culture. And it's not just here in the United States, it's global. So yes, I, I, I do concur with you that um, Mia's character is uh, the, the, the character of hope and light. And she's the one who creates this uh, uh, transformation within the culture, within her own private um, uh, world. And, and you were saying, Saviana? Yeah, exactly. I was, yeah, I just wanted to add to that, that yeah, Mia is the voice of hope and we are both professors. So our students, I see them every day. They are the ones who are bringing the change and they are the ones who are breaking the silence and speaking up. And they are the ones, our students and the, the young people in the US and everywhere, because I spoke to, a, to the University of Bucharest and the students there are also this kind of new voices fresh voices that speak uh, up and uh, really uh, challenge and demolish barriers and borders of thought. 
Uh, in a way, like I was, uh, you know, as a college student in Romania at the revolution, I had the feeling that, you know, we did something, we brought uh, something new. And now there's the turn of this young generation, in global generation in the US and Romania and everywhere to, to bring the change in terms of equity, uh, equality, uh, diversity, human rights and racial rights. Yeah, and I, I think that they're even more than we did, Saviana. That they understand the interconnectedness of uh, of our world in a in a different way, and at a younger age than we did. Even when I see the the, the activists who are out there, and they are very young, and they are and they understand these issues in a very deep way, and and it's global. It's not just here. It's it's globally. The, and I think um, for all the issues with the uh, the technology. Um, there are some advantages to it and that we see it in how the young people are using it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point that the internet and now the global web <laughs> is bringing us together and the voices uh, uh, can be heard by, you know, on a global level. And absolutely, I mean, you know, as a college student, I only knew my little word over there in <laughs> Romania, a little bubble. Uh, but now people are interconnected and the young generation is truly bringing a new, fresh, um, equitable uh, perspective. Yeah. And that's wonderful. I think few things that I've noticed is um, a lack of fear. So, you know, they're fearless. This, I, they, they don't seem to have anything to lose <laughs> at this point, right? Yeah. And more so uh, being aware of the consequences of modern day slavery. You know, they are, they are very much aware of the fact that one of the implications of it is poverty. So if we if at a global level we are going to deal with more poverty and with lack of education, then everybody will be affected by it. So being aware of the consequences, it, it's probably a motivator for uh, the young generation. And um, I think we, I mean, I consider myself to be from the older generation, but I'm definitely here to support, encourage and uh, mentor everyone who is willing to have a voice. And so yeah. that, that's the same. I know I know that. And Bernice, <laughs> so though, maybe we need to mention also our wonderful stage manager, your assistant. Yes, uh, uh, Raymond Johannes Kraft, who um, I've been working with Raymond now for at least six, maybe seven years. And um, always having him in the room with us is such a grounding. We have a theater company, a laboratory for actor training, experimental theater company, uh, which was in response to the work we uh, did at the Odin Theatret, um, uh, uh, continuing that kind of work here in the United States. And uh, Raymond is um, the, uh, the, the co company manager here in the States. And um, uh, Gavin Heaney, who um, uh, c comes to us from um, Great Britain and who uh, did our, our, our music and, uh, and uh, the, the video work for, um, for us for this project. We were very, very fortunate to have such a wonderful team supporting us and holding us so that our reading um, uh, looked even uh, uh, more elevated than just a reading, I must say that. Yeah, so again, thanks to Heartbeat Ensemble and the Romanian Cultural Institute in New York, Dorian Brana, who supported us with this project. Yeah, and we are here today to discuss um, the messages of Saviana's last play, uh, Be Trapped Inside the Window, that you can still have the opportunity to, uh, to see it until March 21st, a week from today and we highly recommend uh, you see the play and make comments and ask questions. Um, so what's next, Saviana and Vernice? Hopefully uh, um, a New York production in collaboration with the Heartbeat Ensemble. Um, we, uh, uh, we're in talks right now with um, La Mama, which is a theater company that both Saviana and I um, absolutely hold dear to our hearts. And the hope is that uh, in collaboration with Heartbeat, we will be able to um, uh, do a New York production um, and possibly a production also at Heartbeat in um, uh, Connecticut 
uh, uh, um, beginning there at Heartbeat and then transferring here to New York City. That's the big hope. Yeah, and I was just talking to Godfrey Simmons, the artist director of uh, Heartbeat um, yesterday, I think. And we also hope to take the play and theaters, of course, to be open so we can take the play to Edinburgh, to other European festivals and other global festivals, maybe to the Cairo festival. Let's hope the, the theater world uh, the and theaters will be open so we can travel uh, in, a in the physical space as well as in the digital space with this uh, show. Good luck. That's, that would be wonderful. So many people will have a chance to, to see the play. Um, let's check and see if we have any questions or comments at this moment. Um, Krina, do you, do you have anything for us here? Um, not sure if she's still with us, but I will I will check myself. Well, there is a comment Krina made actually. Oh, Krina is here. Good. <laughs> Sorry, I'm on a bit of uh, of delay on uh, on Facebook. We do not have uh, any comments so far. <laughs> Beyond Maybe. myself, I will. Okay. Yeah. Please go ahead. Sorry, I had to mute the Facebook and <laughs> figuring out the, the technical difficulties. Um, we do not have any comments. Uh, my suggestion um, uh, uh, was um, uh, one of the things that uh, impressed me that the fact that when she opened the window, it was actually opening the window for everybody else. She opened the window to her life, figuring out what's, what she wants to do and also opening the window for her mom to recover and to connect with the world. And of course, for, uh, for Malaysia. Um, was it Malaysia or? Malaya. <laughs> Malaya. Uh, Malaya. Um, so I was, I was really impressed with, uh, with the play. Thank you. That's exactly as the moment I was first, uh, you know, having Mia trying to open the window, not being able to, and then finally, uh, yes, opening the window, and that uh, starts the the yeah the the metaphor of opening up. And yes, we, we didn't talk enough about the mother who's um, uh, a single mother, uh, Russian American, and she is trapped in her own uh, problems as well, uh, in her own problems with herself with her drinking problem and with um, her her black daughter so I did want to to uh, show that dynamic and the mother and daughter um, journey towards understanding each other a little better mm -hmm. yeah uh, <clears throat> any anything else um, Karina from the audience any other um. <laughs> Molly yeah. says, uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, from my, in my experience, many people watch this later, uh, not always live. So we may have more uh, comments or questions and I'm definitely going to uh, pass them along to you. Um, if there isn't anything, oh, they are coming now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> they are coming now, Krina. Oh, yes. <laughs> they are coming. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Kitchen Sink Molly, so I'm guessing her name is Molly, um, commented that many of us who worked in civil rights and women's rights in the 60s opened the way for research and evolution of the current work on justice. And that's so true. Very true. Thank you for your comment, Molly. Yeah, and actually, Andrea. my 
a, a huge inspiration of mine in my plays are the feminist performance artists of the 70s. People like Arolish Niemann, Yoko Ono, uh, and of course, Marina Abramovic. So that's why always in theater, I'm trying to experiment to, with form. And I, I was hugely inspired by the feminist movements of the 60s and 70s, yes. yes. Yeah, lots of inspiration there. Yeah. And I think that every door open counts or window opened absolutely counts. Um, Andrea also has a comment. Uh, I just wanted to thank you uh, to putting a spotlight on this issue. Labor trafficking is never addressed. And I think it's really important to address uh, all aspects of trafficking. Yeah, so maybe a new theme for Saviana and Vernice. <laughs> the more the complexity of modern life uh, slavery to uh, bring it in, in new place, yeah. Well, I do have in the work something on sex, sex traffic. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, that's going to be really powerful for sure. <laughs> uh, coming from you especially, and also because it's again, it's one of those uh, topics that it's a secret at the societal level. We don't talk about it. It's happening, it, we hear about it, but somehow we pretend not to hear or see. I think a big part of it is that uh, we, somehow we have this idea that people who are marginalized, people who um, are disempowered, people who exist in poverty, somehow that they are to blame that, uh, for their for their state in life. And as long as we hold on to that idea to make ourselves feel better, if, if we're not among that group, then we will, we, this, these systems will continue to perpetuate themselves. We have to agree that people born in poverty uh, or people who we pass step over on the streets in order to enter our homes uh, and the security of our homes, that uh, we, we cannot look Look at them as less than or the fact that they brought this on themselves but this is uh, I, I think globally this is how we look at uh, people who are um, uh, you know we have the caste system in, in, in India that still persists today and I, I experienced caste in, in, in Jamaica I know in the Caribbean the, the, the caste system is there that's what they were writing about um, in this piece in the, the Atlantic uh, in the Philippines so we as human animals have to agree to shift this idea that people who are born in poverty or who find themselves in poverty that it's they did not choose that that they did not bring it on themselves and that they deserve a hand up they deserve not to be exploited and, it, and, and I think the reason we keep this, um, the, 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 the preposterous lie alive is because it makes us feel better about ourselves. Yeah, thank you for bringing this up. I think this is an excellent point and we hear all the time, you know, it's one of the main uh, white supremacy mantra, mm -hmm. right? Blaming, blaming those who are, you know, less than, or yeah. you know it's it's their fault pretty much right so it's a lot of blame it's a lot of pointing fingers and mm -hmm. as you said i think that's an that's an excellent point in my opinion uh that's exactly what people are looking for they are looking for that feeling of safety you know i'm better than you i i can do it you can't so i'm feeling much better because in comparison with you uh, I'm above. Yeah. Uh, and that's a real issue. I think it's a real issue that has been uh, supported by the system for so many years. And uh, our intention and mission to dismantle it, it's a heavy one. It's a, it's a lot of work that needs to be done. And you, in your field, do it so well because, you know, through arts, we get to see things in a, in a different way and we are touched by it in a different way. And thank you for that. 
Yeah. And I need to add, I remember that actually I have another play called Useless about organ traffic and human traffic. And it's actually published in my book for a barbarian woman, which is going to be launched this Saturday, this coming Saturday, <laughs> March 20th. Oh. So I forgot about the book launch. Yeah. And the Eureka and Poets Cafe. It was published by uh, Caridad Zvich's No Passport Press. So, yeah. See you Absolutely. at the Eureka. <laughs> so, Saviana, it probably it's going to be helpful if you write in the comments, you know, the information about your book. So uh, those who are watching or will come back to watch later, they will see the information about the, um, the book uh, and also about the play we are going to post again uh, where they can register to see the play. And congratulations on the launch, Saviana. Yes. Yay. yes, that Thank sounds you. amazing. And congratulations to both of you to, you know, invest your emotional energy and your potential into creating something so meaningful like this play and all of your work. We, um, I and we at Archer salute you and uh, appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Thank you, Mihaela. And it's been such a pleasure to work with Bernice. I think I finally found a director I can really connect with. I, I, I love to work with Bernice and we had a wonderful uh, creative team cast uh, as well. Yeah, it, it, it was a mutual admiration society in that I've known Saviana's work. I think I've known Savi since you came to the US, right? So, and we've been parts of the same circle for the Lark and other circles. So to have this opportunity to bring our collective uh, knowledge to bear on uh, her, her work, it's such a wonderful opportunity. And I thank uh, Godfrey Simmons for inviting me into this journey and uh, for us finding each other in the studio. I, I just absolutely love working with you. That's great. We hope to see more plays coming from your contribution and work together and we are looking forward to that. Um, to end this event, um, which, you know, it's, it's always hard for me to end something that is so alive and meaningful. Uh, but it came to the end of it. So I would like now if you can um, say again, you know, for those who haven't been with us from the beginning, uh, if you can say one more time, what's the message that you want to convey through this play? And before you answer, I'm sorry, before you answer, we have one more comment I'm hearing from, uh, from uh, Karina. So let's give, um, give her a chance to, to say the comment, to read the comment. Debbie said that I did not watch the play, but Vernice, I agree with you. No one asks to be born in their situation. Therefore, we should not be so eager to blame them for trying to reach out to grab at a situation which offers hope. It's just said that there are scavengers out there who seek to profit of others' misfortune. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Yeah, so coming to the end, what's the message? I mean, we heard a lot of messages, but what's the, what do you want people to, uh, what's the takeaway? for the audience. I'll start so that Savvy can have the last word. Um, for me, I, I think the example that Mia puts forth, which is that we all have the ability to look around and to make change for the better in our community, that um, to have the courage to ask the hard questions and the willingness to walk the, that, that the hard road of change. Um, it, it may not be around this specific issue uh, 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 of domestic slavery, but in any is issue of injustice, the, to ha that what is required, number one, is seeing the injustice. Number two, questioning how am I complicit in this? And then what are the tools that I have that I can bring to make a difference? 
And I think that if people walk away from this um, play, having seen it, read it, uh, um, been exposed to it with that sense of how am I complicit? What can I do? For me, that is a, a message that I'd, I'd love for it to impart. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bernice. And yes, um, as I said, I consider my humble mission as, and responsibility as a playwright and activist to open windows towards this kind of situations, to try to make uh, invisible uh, voices visible as much as I can, to try to, to fight for social justice and uh, uh, social change. And um, as we are all, to a certain extent, to different extents, uh, be trapped, trapped inside the window. Uh, let's make um, our mission as uh, human animals, as uh, humans, let's make all uh, our mission, this opening of windows, looking beyond walls, um, real and imagined, beyond borders, real and imagined, towards a real connection uh, among people. Only together we can be who we really are in this uh, globally connected world. We all need to see each other, to really see each other and speak up for each other. Thank you so much. No better ending than this. Um, thank you so much to both of you. Uh, we wish you good luck. And um, we wait for more um, of your art to be available to us and learn from you. Um, appreciate you being here with us. And again, um, in the name of Archer, American Romanian Coalition for Human and Equal Rights, we thank you and we wish you good luck. And for those who have not seen the play yet, you still have time until March 21st be trapped inside the window. Thank you, Saviana and Bernice, and thank you everybody who supported us and was here today for this event. Thank you.